John Grisham, the internationally renowned novelist, has written a shortish book which is just published in paperback form in, in this country entitled Skipping Christmas. It's the story of uh, Luther and Nora Crank, spelt with a K, who uh, decide to do that this particular year, to skip Christmas with all the, the multitude of trimmings associated with it in order to save themselves $7,000. But they find it's not so easy as they thought because of the enormous amount of pressures uh, around them and upon them. Skipping Christmas. Culturally, is that quite appealing to you? Well, perhaps it is. But theologically, I hope it isn't. Although you know there are some Christian people who say, that we should skip very quickly over the Christmas narrative and, and get to the real themes and chapters about the gospel. That's to say, the things in connection with the life and death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. But in chapter 1 of his marvelous gospel, Luke, right at the very beginning, sets before us his great theme and the main project, as it were, of the gospel, which is the saving of the human race through the coming of Christ. And it seems that right at the very outset, right at the very beginning of the gospel, Luke, the writer, wants the readers, including ourselves, to discover how we may be sure that we are among the saved. For there is nothing that is more important for human beings than this. And you may recall that Luke right away at the beginning of the gospel in verses 1 to 4 of chapter 1 uh, tells us that he's writing this gospel uh, to somebody called Theophilus. Now that may be a real name of a thoughtful inquirer of the day, or it may be a symbolic name meaning a friend of God. That's what the name means. And uh, I assume that uh, most, if not all of us here this morning, are in that category. And so, how does Luke help the Theophiluses amongst us here this morning to be sure that we are saved and uh, to be clear about his gospel? Well, it seems to me that in this marvelous announcement passage, there are two great truths about the coming of Jesus Christ which are highlighted by Luke uh, for us, the readers. And we'll look at these in turn. And here's the first, the first great truth, that Jesus Christ was born of the Virgin Mary. In verses 26 to 34, uh, Luke focuses on this individual Mary. And so we ask ourselves, who, who was she? And Luke identifies her clearly as the virgin. No less than three times in just a few verses, he underlines this for us. First of all, in verse 27. So we read from verse 26. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth to a virgin, pledged or betrothed to be married to a man named Joseph. Now, betrothal in the first century Palestine is very different from engagement in 21st century Scotland. Betrothal in those days was really almost as binding as marriage itself. And it could only be dissolved by divorce or by death. And if there was a girl betrothed to a man and he during the betrothal period died, then in the eyes of the law, she would be regarded as a widow. And by all accounts, most young girls were betrothed in their 13th year. And it lasted for 12 months, during which time they stayed at home with their parents until the wedding day and then sexual union. So Mary, like all other girls in, in, in that category, was a virgin. And there's a second mention just a few words later in the last part of the same verse 27. Uh, 
Luke has no reason to actually mention this again, but he does just to say that the readers have got it. The virgin's name was Mary. But it's the third reference that is the most significant in verse 34. After the announcement given by the angel, Mary asks the question, verse 34, How will this be, since I am a virgin? Now that's an odd question when you think about it. She had just been told by the angel that she who is betrothed to a man who is a descendant of David will have a son who is a descendant from David. Well, no big surprise there. Except that it was. It was a massive shock to Virgin, uh, to, to Mary. Now, why was that? Well, either she took it that the angel's message was that she was going to have a son during the betrothal period, in which case she was a virgin, or if she wasn't thinking that straight, then the one thing that did register in her mind was that it was a very surprising thing indeed that an angel should talk about children while she was not yet married and a virgin. Either way, there's a reference. In fact, three references. And Luke expects Theophilus to add two and two together and get the right answer, namely that Jesus Christ was born of the Virgin Mary. That is crystal clear. Now, is the virgin birth important? There are a number of Christians, scholars, ministers, leaders, and church members who say, no, not at all. They would say that the really important thing is that that Christ uh, came into the human race, the incarnation. But it's not really that important that he entered by a miraculous route, the virgin birth. Professor Joachim Jeremias speaks for many when he says these verses represent not history, but poetry. But would Theophilus have thought of these verses as not history, but poetry? I don't think so. Not if he remembered the way that Luke introduced himself as a careful historian, verses 2 and 3, and went on to say that he was intending to set before Theophilus the certainty of the things that are taught. Theophilus would automatically conclude that the virgin birth, verses 26 to 34, falls into this category. Certainty of historical truth. Now, if, if Luke intends this, to be seen in this way, it must be important. Wherein lies the importance then of the virgin birth? Well, it acts as a kind of sign. In the New Testament, miracles in reference to Jesus Christ are sometimes called signs. Acts chapter 2 and verse 22, for example, So the virgin birth, it seems to me, acts here as a kind of signpost. What do you need a signpost for? Well, you need a signpost if you're lost. I meet with a young man regularly in Kilsyth to look at the Bible. And a couple of months ago he said to me, I'm lost. I don't know where I am or where I'm going. And how many people in our country around Christmas time are in that category? Perhaps those in the younger generation. And I do wonder, you know, whether the sudden tragic death of Gary Speed, the Welsh football manager, somehow awakened people to the fact that being of celebrity status, having success, having wealth, having good looks, can never be the answer to the aching void of lostness within. And the virgin birth is a sign which points us to how we may get hold of that salvation which answers that aching void and brings us security and salvation within. But in what way is it a sign in particular? What does the virgin birth point to? Well, in the first place, the virgin birth 
is a sign of the supernatural character of the Christian gospel. In chapter 1 of his gospel, Luke underlines that this was a supernatural break into our world, the coming of Christ. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, verse 26. The angel went to her, verse 28. But the angel said to her, verse 30. Angels, predictions, miracles are intrinsic to Luke's gospel, to the gospel which is supernatural. And the virgin birth essentially underlines a supernatural character of the gospel. And the virgin birth, said Karl Barth, one of the great theologians of the 20th century, and the virgin birth is posted on guard at the door of the mystery of Christmas, he says, and none of us may think we can hurry past it. Karl Barth goes on to say, It stands at the threshold of the New Testament, blatantly supernatural, blatantly supernatural. And we we must be prepared for the supernaturalism of the gospel. Without that supernatural character, the gospel is meaningless. And if faith staggers at the mention of the virgin birth right at the outset, how is it going to cope with the feeding of the 5,000, the stilling of the storm, the raising of Lazarus, the description of the transfiguration, and then, most sublimely of all, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead on the third day and appearing to his disciples? Without the supernatural... There is no gospel. There is no good news. The good news of the the dispensing of forgiveness of sins to all who will receive it, the gift of salvation and the receiving of eternal life. The virgin birth is a sign of the supernatural character of the gospel. But in addition, secondly, the virgin birth is a sign of the Savior and ruler for humans. Verse 31, you the virgin will give birth to a son and you'll give him the name Jesus, Savior. Verse 31, and he will reign forever, ruler. So the virgin birth points to the Savior and ruler for human beings. And and notice that this is provided from above. If the Savior ruler was provided merely from below, that's to say, in the human way of doing things, then what would mean would be this? The guilt of Adam as a sinner would be imputed to and transferred to and passed on to Jesus in his nature. As the Scripture says, as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. There's a contrast. And so the Savior ruler is provided from above. And that, you see, is the Savior that we need. It gives us hope that our old human nature, sinful as it is, can be overcome because of Christ's new nature. And this is what happens in conversion. Very moving. And that's what conversion is. The virgin birth is assigned to the Savior and ruler for human beings. And we can safely entrust our lives, feeling very much the transitory nature of life and the changing of circumstances and situations and is wondering where he, she can find something solid and substantial to build his or her life upon. Oh, here it is. Of the Savior and ruler, Luke says, His kingdom shall never end. Jesus Christ was born of the Virgin Mary. That's the first truth. And the second truth, Jesus Christ was conceived 
by the Holy Spirit. Verses 35 to 38. Now, many of you will recognize in these two truths that I'm underlining uh, words of the Apostles' Creed, that well-known and famous Christian creed which many congregations uh, together, corporately, repeat on special occasions, including Christmas and Easter time and other great festivals. You remember the words of the Apostles' Creed at this particular point? I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost and born of the Virgin Mary. And today I've reversed the order of these two things and in line with, with Luke's structure here in verses 35 and following. And in verse 35, we learn of this, uh, this conception by the Holy Spirit. These wonderful and majestic and yet mysterious words. Let me read them again. The angel said to Mary when she asked, How can this be? The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. What a remarkably brief and chaste statement in such marked contrast to the lurid tales of, of pagan gods having sexual relationship with human beings to produce their offspring. There is no suggestion in this verse of God taking the place of the human father Joseph in marriage. In fact, the language that Luke uses here is that of creation, not generation. What we have here is a new creative act of God. And just as the existence of the universe is explained by the Holy Spirit hovering over the waters, Genesis 1 verse 2, so the conception of Christ is explained by the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit on the womb of the Virgin. Now, one of the major objections to the virgin birth or the virgin conception is the fact that if this happens, say many theologians, then this will mean that Jesus Christ is not like us. Jesus Christ is not one of us. He is not able to share our humanity. But this is not so. In this conception by the Holy Spirit, God is providing a new and a true humanity for us. A humanity that helps us and, and saves us. A humanity that is a holy humanity. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. So Jesus Christ was wholly human, W-H-O-L, as well as being wholly human, H-O-L. He was truly human, truly human, in that he had a human body with the same biochemical composition as ours, the same central nervous system, the same sensitivity to pain. And to this genetic composition, his mother Mary made the same contribution as any human mother makes to the genetic makeup of the child. He was truly human. And yet he was sinlessly human. The rest of his chromosomes were imparted to him by the miraculous conception and creative act of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead. And this is the Savior we need, this human divine Savior. On the one hand, he shares in our human experiences to the full. On the other hand, He saves us by His divine, holy humanity. The very Savior that we need. Let me give you three examples of this. Take for, first of all, this great issue of temptation, which all of us here this morning uh, face in life in some way or another, in some degree or another. Now, Jesus was wholly human, truly human. He was tempted, says the Bible, in all points as we are. Hebrews 4, verse 14. 
John Calvin says, amidst the violent shock of temptation, Jesus vacillated, as it were, from one wish to another. Do you identify that with that in your temptations? Vacillating from one wish to another. Jesus was truly tempted in all points as we are. Yet the verse goes on to say, he was without sin. A holy humanity. The writer of the Hebrews draws a conclusion, therefore he is able to help all of us who are tempted. And that is true. And you've found that, haven't you? Turning to Jesus Christ, trusting in him, asking for help in this temptation. And uh, marvelously, his, his holy humanity comes to give us strength and help to say no. Temptation, then the area of joy. This is the second example. As human beings, we long to have joy as one of the great ingredients and experiences of life. And Jesus Christ shares in our joys because he was truly human and helps us in our joys. Quite a lot is made that in the Bible there's no reference to Jesus smiling or laughing. Far too much is made of that. Because for one thing, the joyless life is a sinless life. Luke, later on in his gospel, chapter 10, verse 21, tells us that Jesus was full of joy by the Holy Spirit. And in John 15 and verse 11, Jesus refers to his own joy. He truly was human in that way. He, he knew what it was to experience joy. But there was a sinless element to his joy in that he wanted to help us with his joy. So in John 15 verse 11, he says, I have said these things to you that my joy might be in you and your joy might be complete. Isn't that wonderful? Jesus Christ in his coming, conceived by the Holy Ghost, has this human holy joy that he wants to share with us and bring to us. And at Christmas time, he understands the things that bring us joy. And he wants to be part of it and to help us to experience, not only at Christmas time, but in the year that is lying ahead to experience the purest, deepest, highest joy that there is, which he has in himself by his gospel through the Holy Spirit for those who believe. Third example would relate to fear something that we experience all of us in one way or another at some time or another in some greater degree than, than others perhaps. And Jesus knew fear, human fear. He, he knew the same feelings and emotions that we experience. Only he experienced it in a, in a far greater and heightened way than we do as he faced death in the Garden of Gethsemane. And there was a holy nature to that fear because he was experiencing it on his way to the cross so that he could free us from that ultimate fear of the last enemy. Do you remember how the writer to the Hebrews puts it in chapter 2? He said, since we children have flesh and blood, he, Jesus Christ, shared in our humanity that by his death he might destroy him who had the power of, of death, that is to say the devil, and free all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong bondage. And he really does this. He really does free us from the, the sting of death. That great stalker who stalks us down the years and stalks us in, incessantly in our later years and brings such fear and dread to us. And Jesus Christ in his true and holy humanity and by his work on the cross frees us from this terrible tyranny of dread. 
he was conceived by the Holy Ghost. And Luke adds in verse 37, and nothing shall be impossible to God. Say Theophilus, 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 you, you really are a friend of God this morning, aren't you? Well, if you are, rejoice in the provision of this Savior and ruler that God has brought from above for you. Rejoice in the one who is the friend of sinners and your friend who will save you to the uttermost and help you day by day. Or is there somebody who wants to be a Theophilus? Who knows he or she is not yet a friend of God but wants to be? Let me say to you, what better time than this Advent season, this Christmas time, to become a friend of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Entrust yourself afresh to Him today. Or perhaps for the very first time. Remember, no one is beyond redemption. Nothing shall be impossible to God. And remember, Jesus used almost these exact words in the Gospel, Mark chapter 10, when the disciples were asking Him the question, who then can be saved? And He said, with man it's impossible, but with God all things are possible. No one's beyond redemption. Anyone may come and find in Jesus Christ salvation and eternal life. Your very self to Him, past, present, and future, then as you do that, this is what will happen. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, and then that holy thing will be born in you the seed of eternal life a living faith in God and from God. Even the Holy One Himself, Jesus Christ, will be born in Him, born in you. That's what the carol says. Happens, remember the words of one of the verses of that lovely carol, O little town of Bethlehem. It seems to me the, the verse of the carol is, is, is tremendously dramatic for a church and for a preacher preaching the gospel. You never know what might happen in a congregation, in somebody's heart, in somebody's life. The verse says, How silently, how silently the wondrous gift is given, and God imparts to human hearts the blessings of His heaven. No ear may hear His coming, but in this world of sin, where meek souls will receive Him, still the dear Christ enters in. Oh, may it be so in these days, for nothing is impossible to God. May he bless you this Christmas time and his word to all your hearts.